I'm pleased to welcome you to this talk that is sponsored by the American Center in Moscow on the U.S. elections in the American political party system. My name is Sandy Maisel. I have for the last 50 some years been a professor of American government at Colby College in Waterville, Maine, where I've taught courses on American politics, governments, and particularly on political parties and elections. I've written a number of books on American political parties and elections and taught courses specifically on this topic, which causes something of a problem in that this discussion is going to go on for about an hour. And normally I spent cover 13 or 14 hours to talk about this subject. So please bear with me. Um, my goal is to speak for about 45 to 50 minutes and then to leave time for question and answers. If you put the questions and answers into the chat, I will try to get to them as many of them as I can at the end of our time together. One more thing about me that you should know is I've written two very short reference designed specifically for non-Americans. And the other is a forthcoming book that I have done with my colleague, Jennifer Yoder, on elections, basically elections internationally, comparatively around the world. And it is themes of that book that I'm gonna talk about today because we started that book about a year, two years ago, um, because we were concerned about the state of American elections and the way the American elections, the American party system worked. And we wanted to explore other systems around the world other dem democratic systems around the world to see if there were aspects of those systems that should be or could be applied to the United States. So we will see, and I will get to some of those uh, points later on in this talk. I'm assuming that most of you who are listening are here for one of two reasons. One is you want to know why, if every poll that anybody has put out in the last two months say that somewhere over two thirds of the American people do not want to see a, a rematch between President Trump, uh, between President Biden and former President Trump. Why, if that is the case, are we likely to see a rematch between President Biden and former President Trump? And I will deal with that. And I suppose there are some of you who are out there saying, I wonder if this person who knows a lot about American politics and elections, at least claims to, or by reputation does, is going to tell us who's likely to win that election. Well, I'm not a betting person, but I will give you some ideas of things that you should look at to know who you think is going to win this election. However, before we can get to the question of why Biden versus Trump, or before we can get to who's going to win a re-election of Biden versus Trump, I think it's important for you to understand um, the fundamentals of how the American system work and the American party system work and American elections work, because the answer to both of those questions are endemic in the system that we have created, a system which, as I've said a moment ago, I think is highly imperfect, but the best that we have. So let me start talking about the basic American party system. Our system is a competitive two-party system. The Democrats have run against the Republicans as the only two major contestants for office in every United States national election since 1856. That sounds like it's a stagnant system, but in fact, it isn't a stagnant system. What the Democrats stand for and what the Republicans stand for has changed often over the years when the two party system came into existence as it exists today in the election of 1856, the election of 1860. The issue was slavery, and Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party wanted to abolish slavery or certainly not let slavery spread uh, beyond the states that currently had it. There's some question about that. And the Democratic Party was a, a party that was dependent on people from states which, whose economy depended on slavery. And that divided the country, as most of you know, it led to a brutal civil war with Americans killing Americans for a four-year period. And it led to a fairly stable party system uh, through most of the 19th century in which you had uh, people who had been on the side of the Union against people who had been uh, on the side of the se secessionists with the um, Unionists winning most of those elections the Republican Party. The next divide was in the turn of the century between the 1880s, 1890s, and roughly 1930, in which the question was, on what should we base the American economy? Should it be based on a gold standard and very tough credit or a silver standard and easy credit? 
The Democrats were for the silver standard, the Republicans for the gold standard. That divided those elections. Then came the Great Depression of 1929. And that caused a radical change in who the parties were. The Democrats became the parties of the working man. They became the party of the poor. They became the party of the of minorities. They were the party that essentially said the government has to be the employer of last resort. The government has to stabilize the economy because the laissez-faire system could not do that. Uh, the Republicans, on the other hand, tended to be the farmers, the 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 party of Wall Street, of big business, farmers. Uh, it was mostly a, a Caucasian party, and those changes have continued. So that uh, I think many people would say that they are changing. In fact, today as well, that the uh, Republican Party, uh, particularly the MAGA, the President, former President Trump wing of the Republican Party has become a party of social of uh, social conservatives, of people who feel uh, that things have turned against them, that, that the economy is against them, that the direction the country is going is the wrong direction. And the Democratic Party has been the party, the party of, of Joe Biden, who said the government, in fact, can help people, that programs like infrastructure and, and uh, building um, up, up our, our infrastructure and repairing it or dealing with cyber security party and the Republicans more, uh, at least the Trump wing of the Republican Party is more an isolationist party, very much different from what it had been party system. Lots of other democracies don't have two party systems. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. They have multi-party systems for many. Some have two parties plus a third strong minority party. Some have four or five parties that compete for each other. We have two. And I think there are generally three reasons given for this. The first reason is a historical dualism. At the time of the founding of the country in the late 18th century, there were some people who wanted to have a new constitution and a new federal government, and there were some people who didn't. Our first government after the American Revolution was a Confederate form of government. It was a very weak central government, very strong state governments. Uh, and other and some people thought that wasn't working and we should have a stronger federal government. So we had a, a natural clash between those who wanted the new constitution, those who did not want the new constitution in the late uh, 1780s. And that persisted uh, as, as expressed by people who wanted a strong federal government uh, led by those of you who know the musical, Alexander Hamilton, um, and those who wanted a weaker federal government and stronger state governments led by Thomas Jefferson uh, a plantation owner in Virginia who actually changed his view on that once he became president of the United States in the early part of the 19th century. So you have this historical dualism and it has continued. We've always had two parties. As I said, since 1856, it's been the Democrats and the Republicans, but before that it was uh, different parties had uh, competed, but always two. The second explanation, which is frequently given, is that major issues tend to divide the American public. And there are issues on which there is very little compromise. So then after the Great Depression, the issue was, what should the role of government be? Should the government be the employer of last resort? Should the government be responsible for taking care of those who were less fortunate and couldn't take care of themselves? Should the government be responsible for, um, the federal government be responsible for integrating the society in the South particularly? Um, if you deal with social issues, there's a dualism. Are you, do you think abortion should be legal and, and accessible to all women, or do you think it should be restricted? That's a dualism. There's very little on, in between that. Should the Americans play an uh, a important role in international affairs and try to spread democracy and defend uh, small-D Democrats around the world? Uh, or should the Democrats be isolationists? Or should, that's a dualism. And one party's on one side, one party is on the other side. I think those are both interesting hypotheses. I think there's something to be said for both of those. I also think they're both wrong. Um, I think the reason why we have a two-party system in the United States and not in other places, are there are institutional reasons. And I'm going to give you a number of these institutional reasons, things that in some cases distinguish the United States from other countries. In many cases, um, in virtually all cases, these are all part of the American scene, and no other country has quite as many of them as we do. And I'm not saying that they're good. I'm saying that they exist. The first one is that in 
the federal government and in all but one state government of our 50 state governments. So basically throughout the entire country and in all electoral systems, um, we elect members of legislatures through single member districts, generally with the first past the post plurality winner. So I live in what is called the second congressional district of Maine. We have one congressman, his name is Jared Golden. He will run against somebody else and only one of them will win. Uh, and that is the same in the 40 some districts of 52 districts of California. It's the same in uh, uh, two districts of Rhode Island. It's in the same in the, I think, 29 districts of New York. Each district elects one person. Even the United States Senate, which has two from every state, they are elected separately. And in each election, only one United States senator is. So um, there is a single prize, and there is no no prize for coming in second place. Related to that, and, and some people think more important to that is, our presidency is the single biggest prize. If you ask America, it's the president of the United States of America, it's, it's President Biden, and you get nothing for coming in second in a presidential election. It is all or nothing, you're either the president or you're not the president. We don't have coalition presidents as they have in many countries around the world. Um, it, and um, the, the comparison there is to countries that have multi-member districts or parliamentary systems. In multi-member districts, you might have five parliamentarians elected from one particular district. And if a party gets 60% uh, of the vote, they will get three of those five representatives. And if two other parties each get 10% of the vote, they will each get one. Or if one party gets 20%, that party will get two. And that can be either districts or it can be in a country like Israel where there is one 100 member, 120 member Knesset, and they are all elected nationally, but by proportional representation. So any party that gets more than a minimum percentage of the votes is guaranteed a representative in the Knesset. The result of that frequently is coalition governments. And coalition governments give an incentive to small parties because even if they don't win, even if they come in, and in the case of Israel, fifth or sixth or seventh, they may be needed by one of the bigger parties in order to form a governing coalition. So there's an incentive for third parties, an electoral incentive and a governing incentive to, for third parties to win. And you will see in many parliamentary systems where there is not a majority, where only the leading party only has a plurality. Let me make sure that that term is understood. A majority is 50% plus one, so more than half, a plurality is more votes than anybody else. So in a parliamentary system, if no party gets a majority, and that party, and therefore the candidates for prime minister don't have a majority, the parties get together, the two leading parties get together with other parties and try to form a coalition. And if, if you are, for instance, a Green Party, you might say to a candidate who's seeking your support, I will support you for prime minister, if you will give me these policies that I care about for the environment, uh, or you're seeing in, in Israel today, if you are a far right party, a far right religious party you might say to the prime minister, in this case, prime minister Netanyahu, I will join your coalition, but you must do the following thing. You lose the majority and we'll have to have another election. None of that exists in the United States. The president is elected, the president may be elected in with Congress controlled by the other party. It doesn't matter. He is he or she, the United States so far only he, is the president. Um, and third parties have no power, really very few, and they all tend to caucus with either the Democrats or the Republicans because only the two parties have power in the legislature. One can argue either of those is better. Um, the American system creates an automatic majority it should make it easier to govern. Parliamentary system is probably more representative, although it may be more difficult to govern. There was a case a couple of years ago where it took the Belgian government over a year and a half in order to form a government, to form a coalition because they were so closely divided. I've mentioned the, United, the states in the United States, and they are also important, another institutional reason. We are a federal system. Um, we, we, we are the United States of America. 
uh, that there is some power that is given to the national government, much power given to the national government, but a great deal of power still resides in the states. So state governors are important, state legislators are important, and the Constitution says the time, place, and manner of elections, including federal elections, shall be determined by the states. The result of that is that we have 50 separate state governments that all set their own rules. You might remember that I said in most of our single member districts, people are elected by a plurality of the vote. That's not true in all districts because states set their own rules. In Maine, the state in which I live, for instance, a number of years ago, we voted for ranked choice voting. In ranked choice voting, uh, as you step into the voting booth, all the names are listed on a ballot and you pick your first candidate first, your preference first, your second preference second, your third preference third, and your fourth, depending on how many candidates there are. The votes are then tallied. If somebody wins a majority of the, vo of the votes, that person is elected. If nobody wins a majority, just a plurality, whoever comes in last is eliminated and that person's votes are redistributed to whoever was their first choice. So I mentioned Jared Golden, my congressman. The first time he was elected, after the votes were counted, he was in second place. But, but, but the person who was leading only had, I think, 47.5% of the vote. And, and now Congressman Golden had about 46 or 47% of the vote. But there were approximately... Um, I think eight percentage of the votes um, that went for third or fourth party candidates. And when those votes were re reattributed, given to the second choice of those candidates, Congressman Golden got over 50% of the vote. So why doesn't everybody do that? Because it has to be done on the state level. It was a huge campaign in Maine to do that. And uh, it took a very long time uh, for people to, to accept ranked choice voting. But they do, and it has spread throughout the country very, very slowly. There are other systems which are used in a number of other different states for, for nominations particularly. Today in the United States is Super Tuesday, which means that it is a primary day and there are more elections being held today than on any other day. One of the elections being held is for a United States Senate nomination in the state of California for the seat that was left vacant by the death of former Senator Dianne Feinstein, who died during this year as a, she was in her 90s when she died. According to the Constitution of California, and I think almost every state, if a United States Senator dies, the governor appoints a new Senator to serve out until the next general election, and then there will be a general election. That's what's happening in California. So in most states, the Democrats hold a primary and the Republicans hold a primary. And whoever the Democrat and any minor candidates can hold a primary or can even have just a, a small gathering of their members to select a candidate. Um, each state sets their own primary rules. In Maine, we have ranked choice voting in our primaries. California set a very different set of rules. California, there is no Democratic or Republican primary. All of the candidates appear on one ballot on the vote that's being held today. And if anybody wins a majority on that ballot, that person is declared the winner of the general election rarely happens. But if not, the top two candidates go on to the general election. Well, in the California race that's going on right now, it's very likely that a sitting congressman named Adam Schiff will get the most votes. But it is unclear who will be second between a Republican uh, named Garvey or a congresswoman named Porter. Um, if Porter comes in second, the general election will be between two Democrats. If Garvey comes in second, it will be between a Democrat and a Republican. Um, and any other state can change their rules in a similar kind of way. I talked earlier about the presidency being the key factor in the United States, key position, the biggest prize in the United States, which I think everybody will agree will agree with. Um, and I also said there's only one and there has to be a majority. Well, that's not quite true. It isn't a majority of the votes cast. 
it's a majority of what we call the electoral votes cast. The electoral votes are part of the original constitutional compromise. The debate in the original constitutional convention was between large states and small states. The large states and, and the biggest state then was only maybe four times as big as a small state, five times as big as a small state. Now it is hundreds of times bigger than a small state. But the large states said that we should be electing our president based on popular size of the population. The small states said, oh, no, no. States should have equal representation in electing the presidents. So they made a compromise. And the compromise was that we would be elected by an electoral college. Each state would have a number of electors equal to the number of representatives that is based on population. Our House of Representatives is based on population, plus the number of senators, which is always two. So if a state has 15 congressmen, it would have 17 electoral votes. If a state has two congressmen, it would have four electoral votes. So one congressman would only have three. That gives slightly more power proportionally to the smaller states. But because big states are so much bigger, they have generally have more power. Then the question became for the states, how are the electors to be chosen? Again, if you go back to the constitutional period, it was pretty easy. They didn't care because they all knew they were going to elect George Washington. And, and they did, of course. But over time, it has, the large states have said, wait a minute, we will have more power if all our electors vote together. So that the norm became by the mid 20th century, early 20th century, for every to elect, to have a winner take all election for its electors. If you won the state by 10,000 votes, you got all the electors. If you won the state by a million votes, you got all of their electors. It didn't matter. Um, the result of that, and you remember I said at the beginning that my colleague, Professor Yoder, and I have been uh, critical of some aspects of the, elect of the American electoral system. The result of that was in recent elections, particularly uh, 2000 and 2016, 2000, uh, former Secretary of State and Senator Hillary Clinton in 2016, did not win the electoral votes. They didn't win the electoral votes because they won some states by huge amounts. Democrats tend to win California and North, New York by huge amounts, but they lost other states narrowly. To show how this could work, in the current system, in the 2020 presidential election votes, he narrowly won the electoral vote. And he won it if, if 41,000 votes had switched out of, million, out of hundreds of millions cast. If 41,000 votes had switched in certain key states, Trump would have won the election, even though he badly was beaten in the electoral college and badly beaten. I mean, badly beaten in the popular vote. Well, why do we have that? It's a very conservative state, by the way. Both said, we don't want to have winner take all our, in our elections. So both Maine and Nebraska passed laws which said, we are going to elect one elector from each congressional district, and then we elect two statewide which is sort of what the original system was set up to do their votes. There's a very, Nebraska, as I said, is a very conservative state, but there's one quite liberal congressional district around the city of Omaha. Maine is a sort of purple state, which is say we're not Republican or Democrat, but our first congressional district is very Democratic and our second congressional district is very Republican. So each tends to get one vote, one electoral vote, and then whoever wins the whole state gets the other two. Why don't we change that? because it has to be done on a state by state basis. Then the question becomes, why don't we change it nationally? Isn't this a stupid thing? Why can't we do the whole thing nationally? That in the late 18th century, we have 27 amendments to the constitution. People are elected, House of Representatives, two thirds of the Senate, which has two representatives from every state. And then you have to have the concurrence of three quarters of the legislatures of the various states. So you really have to get something on which there's a great deal of consensus. And frankly, there isn't a consensus on electoral reform because whatever some states think is in their best interest, other states think is not in their best interest. Let me give you two more key factors to remember before we get to Trump versus Biden. The first one is that we have separation of powers, that the Congress and the president 
are elected separately. In an election year when the president is up, the entire Congress is up and actually one third of the Senate is up as, as well. On the same ballot, people go into the voting booth one time and cast their ballot. But it is it not only is not illegal, it's very frequent for somebody to vote for the Democrat for president, a Republican for Congress, a Democrat or a Republican for the United States Senate. And we have what's called the long ballot. You will often have state legislatures, in some cases governors, um, uh, county officials, mayors in some cities, further, further down the ballot. And each of those is elected separately. The result of that is that uh, because people can split their ballot, it is not at all unusual for us to have what we call divided government, which is the president of one party, the Congress of the other party, or even as we have today, the president in the United States Senate of one party, the House of Representatives of the other party. For a law to be passed in the United States, it needs the passage of both the House and the Senate in the exact same format, and the signature of the president. That requires a great deal of negotiation. It only happens if people are willing to negotiate. So what does the separation of powers have to do with the electoral process? Well, I think we're seeing that play out in 2024. Presidential candidates appear literally at the top of the ballot, and then other officers come down under them. And it's not at all unusual for a presidential candidate to help people further down the ballot, but nor is it unusual for a presidential candidate to hurt people further down the ballot. So it comes about in a number of different ways. Um, I, I am an independent. I don't really favor Democrats or Republicans, but I really love Donald Trump. So if he's up there on the top of the ballot, I'm going to vote for him, and I'm going to vote for um, the Republican for candidate for Congress and the Republican for Senate and Republican for governor on down the ballot. Or you can say, I'm a Republican. But I really dislike Donald Trump. So I'm going to vote for the Democrat for President Joe Biden in this case. And you know what? If I'm going to vote for Biden, I might as well give him people to work with. So I'm going to give him some Democrats in the Congress as well. Or I don't like this congressman because he does everything Trump wants. So if that, in that case, Trump is hurting them. And every congressman and every senator has to make that um strategic decision of how closely they want to run with or without the president of the United States. And you will see presidential candidates campaigning in congressional districts, either with or without their congressional candidates or with or without their senator candidates, depending on whether the congressional candidate or the senate candidate wants to be seen with them. And you'll see some will say, God, I can't wait to be seen with President Biden. He's going to really help me in this election. Others are saying, yeah, I think I'm going to be out of town when Biden is here because I don't want to be associated with him. That's a very, very important uh, factor. And candidates relate to the president after he becomes president based on that as well. So you see um, uh, a number of, of Democrats who are, who are saying, I'm going to vote for Biden because Biden needs to pass these programs. He needs to, to pass the, get the budget going, the government funding. He needs to give aid to uh, the aid package for Israel and Ukraine, which is and humanitarian uh, aid to, to the, to the uh, Palestinians in Gaza. So I'm going to vote with him. Or you can see others, in this case, you're seeing very frequently the Republicans saying, I'm going to vote against whatever President Biden proposes because I don't want to help him in the general election. So about a month ago or three weeks ago, there was a very, very strict border control measure passed, bipartisan measure put forth in the Senate uh, negotiated by a very conservative Republican from Oklahoma named Jim Langford and a quite liberal Democrat from Connecticut named Jim Murphy. Um, and it was months of work for these two to get something they could agree on. And the president, former President Trump said, I don't want them to pass that. Why didn't he want them to pass it? it was, it's almost everything the Republicans wanted. He didn't want to pass it because it was going to give President Biden a campaign issue to, to run on and was going to take one away from him. And the Republicans in the Congress went, went along with him and did not pass that. That bill is still pending, but I don't think it's going to be passed today. Let me say just one more point before I get to Biden and Trump. Nominations for all offices in the United States are controlled by the political parties um, who have primaries that are open only to members of their party. Um, and they are run under rules that they set. Um, and that's a very important factor in understanding 
uh, how people get the nomination. Today is Super Tuesday, as I said before. There are primaries in 16 different states. They are run under a whole series of different rules. In some of those states, whoever wins the popular vote among the Republicans gets all of the delegates. And that's almost all going to be uh, former President Trump. In others, and in all of the Democratic states, delegates are, are apportioned proportionally to the number of votes they get. Now, there's only one real candidate running for the Democrats. There are a couple of minor candidates on the ballot, but nobody's going to vote for them. Um, so that, uh, but if if there were cases, there was in, for instance, uh, 2020 when President Biden ran and got the nomination, if he got 50% of the votes, he'd get 50% of the delegates, and whoever came in second would get whatever percentage that person that person has. Um, you are going to hear today, you probably have heard already, um, that Biden and Trump are going to sew up the nomination today. They will. It's no surprise to anybody. But they won't have actually the number of delegates they need to get nominated for a couple of weeks. And the process will go on and the primaries will continue to be to be held. Can't, people will continue to go out to vote. Um, and the reason is that people feel everybody should have their say and be able to send delegates to the two parties' national conventions, which will be held uh, in Chicago and in Milwaukee in, in the summer. Um, and that voters want to state their views so they can say they nominate a candidate. The other thing that happens, which does not get as much publicity in the national press, is that at the same time as we are having presidential elections, we are, uh, primaries, we are having primaries for candidates for the United States Senate and for Congress. And those are very important, and they will go on again in the states that have already held their primaries sometime, somewhat later in the year. Okay, I promised I would say why Biden and why Trump when they're both so un, unpopular, so let me start with why Biden. That's simpler in many ways. It is very difficult to unseat a sitting president, to deny a sitting president who seeks renomination that renomination. Um, when a president is unpopular as George H.W. Bush was, the first President Bush in 1992, people may challenge him somewhat seriously. He was challenged very seriously from his political right by a candidate named Pat Buchanan. But you just can't beat them. It's very hard. They control the party apparatus. They can raise money easily. They have a national campaign organization that's already been in existence. Uh, they have name recognition that everybody knows. Uh, they have done favors for people throughout the country. So Congressman Dean Phillips from Minnesota, who is in fact running against President Biden, spent all of last summer trying to convince well-known Democrats, Gavin Newsom, the, the governor of, of uh, California, Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Wisconsin, uh, Josh Shapiro, the governor of uh, Pennsylvania, um, and others, to run against President Biden. They all said no. It isn't because they don't want to be president of the United States. Probably some of them very much want to be president of the United States. They're very ambitious people by the time you get to be a governor or a senator. It's because they didn't think they could win. So they said, I'm not going to do this because it's, it's suicide. And um, Phillips said, okay, I'm going to do it because there's a lot of dissatisfaction with Biden. Phillips has gotten 2%, 5%, 3% of the vote. He's getting nothing. Um, so you have a challenger, but the challengers receive very few votes, very little attention, and in fact, um, probably do themselves some harm within the party because you're challenging somebody who's popular within the party generally. You all may have heard that there was a uh, sizable vote, more than 100,000, who voted uncommitted in the recent Michigan primary. They did it, the news media says, because of concern over the president's policy in Israel and Gaza. Um, and that's partially true. But if you look back at the history of the vote in Michigan, there have always been um, uncommitted people voting. When President Obama ran for re-election in 2012, about seven or eight percent of the voters voted uncommitted. It's people who are saying, you know, I just want to see somebody else, somebody different. So that was a vote against Biden, uh, to be sure. And there is dissatisfaction against Biden. But it is not dissatisfaction to the team that said that it's going to overthrow him. So that unless President Biden, God forbid, became ill 
or President Biden for some reason decided he did not want to run, President Biden is going to be the Democrats' nominee for the presidency in November. And unless he changes his mind, which I don't think he will, um, Vice President Harris is going to be the vice presidential nominee. And that is all ordained. Um, take me as an example. I am a Democrat. Um, I am for President Biden. I wish he had decided a year ago not to run. He is three years older than I am. I think I'm too old to be president of the United States. I think he's probably too old to be president of the United States. But he decided to run. That was his decision. Um, and made with his wife and his family and his consultants. And, you know, he said, I think I've done a very good job of being president and there's things that I want to do to finish the job. I'm going to try to do it. They voted for me when I was uh, 77 or 70, yeah, 77. Why won't they vote for me when I'm 81? Um, and I can beat Donald Trump and I don't, and I think Donald Trump is a threat to democracy. I don't think anybody else can. I'm going to run. I'm going to support him because I believe all of those things. I wish he didn't run. I wish he had turned it over to a younger generation, but he didn't. And the system is such that an incumbent who seeks the nomination, renomination is going to get it. Why Trump is harder to answer, at least it's harder to answer for me. First of all, in our history, the history of the United States, only one ex-president has ever come back after losing to win again, and that was in the 19th century, Grover Cleveland. Um, and President Trump in some ways does not seem to be a very popular candidate. He's under indictment in four different jurisdictions. There are trials that are likely to be held during the election. Uh, he may be convicted um, uh, during one of those trials before the election. Uh, there are a group of establishment Republicans, uh, former President Bush, Senator Mitt Romney, my Senator Susan Collins, all of whom think that he is dangerous for democracy. Senator Lisa Murkowski, a Republican from Alaska, announced this week that she would never vote for Donald Trump again uh, for president of the United States because she think he is uh, not in line with the values that she has for our democracy. But what they don't understand is that Donald Trump has, since 2016, reshaped the rank and file of the Republican Party in his own image, the so-called MAGA, Make America Great Again, Republicans. That is a party that is based on uh, anti-immigration, on securing the southern border to keep people from coming over that border, on America first and economic policy, uh, anti-NATO, um, thinking that we should not, in fact, um, uh, honor our, uh, our Section 5 pledge to NATO to defend any NATO country that is allied. The Republican Party under Trump is uh, says that we should not be given foreign aid, we should be given loans, we should not be given military aid, we should be giving loans. Um, it's a group of people who feel that everybody is against them, that we are worse off, that they are worse off than they've been before, and it's not their fault, and Trump is going to be their leader. You could say whatever you want about that, um, whether you like that or you don't like it. There are 35 to 40 percent of the American people who do like it. There is a majority of the Republican Party who do like it. He was challenged by Republicans who share his policy views, people like Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, and he beat them all because those people who follow Donald Trump like his approach. They don't find it offensive. They don't find it anti-democratic. They find it, in fact, one they believe in. And what is, it seems to me is most important to know about the challengers to Donald Trump, with the single exception of Nikki Haley, and I'll talk about her a little bit in a second, is they all endorsed him immediately after they left. Despite what he has said about them, despite the terrible things that he has said about some of them as candidates and about their families and about their wives and about their parents, they have all endorsed him. Um, and it seems to me that says something about their ambition and about his power over the party. Only Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina and Trump's United States ambassador to the United Nations, is there, is still running. She's been getting 30 to 40 percent of the vote in many of the, in the primaries that have been held so far. I think she will get less in some of the states that are voting today. Why she is running, it's unclear. But 
what is clear to me is she and his, her supporters are smart enough to know she is not running in order to win because uh, she's going to lose. She may be running because she wants to be the voice of the establishment Republicans. That's a decent reason. She may be running because um, she wants to be the last person standing because she she has said she will not support Trump. She may be running hoping that something happens to Trump and that she is, is out there. I don't know. But she is still out there running and she's raised a lot of money and she can continue running if she wants to. So in all likelihood, it's going to be Biden versus Trump. Trump will be the nominee, like Biden, unless he withdraws, which he's not going to do, unless he has a health issue, which we all hope doesn't happen to anybody, or perhaps unless he's convicted in one of these trials and we, that's unprecedented. We don't know what would happen in the United States under that. Okay, in the time that I have remaining, I want to tell you who's going to win. No, I'm not. Nobody's going to predict who is going to win. Today's polls all say it is going to be Trump. Um, and they all have him up by four or five points. And because of what we saw in 2020, a Democrat needs to win by three or four points in order to have a chance to win because of the Electoral College. Because Democrats will pull up big majorities in states like California and New York. And they have to be able to, they, to win the close states like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. Um, the Biden people, well, the other thing we see is the Trump supporters are very enthusiastic about Trump. The Biden supporters are not very enthusiastic about Biden. Only about a quarter of the Biden supporters say they are enthusiastic about Biden. He thinks those unenthusiastic people will return to him when the choice is clear to everybody, when everybody sees that most, that this is going to be either Trump or Biden. And he is right in arguing that most people aren't paying any attention to this campaign at all at this point. There are lots of things that are going to happen between now and November, and we don't know what they are. The war in Ukraine may take a turn one way or the other. The war in the Middle East may take a turn one way or the other. The American economy may be continuing on its positive course, or it may turn to a negative course. We don't know. And the last thing we don't know is... What about third parties? We know that there are going to be more than two candidates on the ballot. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is a libertarian, son of a former icon of many on the left, but certainly not from the left. His whole family has renounced his candidacy. But he's been polling in around 3 or 4%. There will be a libertarian candidate on the ballot. There will be a Green Party candidate on the ballot. And among them, they're going to get 3 to 5% of the votes, I think. Um, where they get those votes are important. Who those votes come from are important. Pollsters have just begun to ask that. It looks like they overall help Trump, but there's some parties that we don't know whether they're gonna be on the ballot in each state. You need a certain number of signatures to be on the ballot in each state. Um, in this election, there are only about six to eight states, the ones that I just listed, uh, which are gonna be very close. And what you have to look at and what the candidates are looking at is how the third parties are affecting them in those states. And we just don't know that. Uh, this time. But those are where you should be watching if you want to watch this election. Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, I'm, not, I'm sorry, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. The election is going to be decided in those states. Let me just close by saying why, or asking, why Americans have kept this flawed system where we have minority winners, uh, where we have few votes in a very few states really decide who's going to be the winner, where we have huge expensive campaigns, unclear the campaigns if, are, are changing anybody's minds, uh, where we have mass media um, pandering to candidates going on. And this is the question that Professor Yoder and I asked in our book. And our answer came down is that there's no other system that is clearly better, that every system seems to have its flaws. That's the theme of our book. But there are some aspects of ours that are worse than others, one of which is that we have 50 different electoral management systems, and there's no reason we shouldn't have one, um, that we could, in fact, have some aspect of proportional representation, or at least more people having a say using ranked choice voting or some alternative around the nation. But it's hard to change, and it has to be done on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, And in the final analysis, Americans, I think, generally feel 
But this system has worked pretty well for them during their lifetime, whoever it is during their particular lifetime. And we're not sure that they should change um, anything to something that is unknown. Um, when we adopted ranked choice voting in the state of Maine, it was the fear of the unknown that caused people to vote against it. And it took really two or three cycles before people thought uh, it was a good thing. And I think that's not unusual uh, for change in any system. So that can we, should we get rid of the electoral college system, which is clearly an anachronism? Absolutely, should we, we should get rid of it. Are we likely to get rid of it? I don't think so. Should third parties have more influence? I can make the argument they should. Are they likely to have more influence? Not until we get rid of uh, single member districts and first pass the post. Should we restrict the amount of money spent in campaigns? Not unless the Supreme Court uh, changes its membership and says that, that money is not the equivalent of speech. All of those things are flaws in our system uh, that I think we can't change, uh, but that if you don't understand, you don't understand who's going to win, how the battle is going to be fought. So I hope I've given you some food for thought. I see that there's some questions in the, sh the chat. I will turn to the chat now and see if I can answer some of those questions. Um, first question is, what procedure or event is supposed to be the most important in the election process nowadays? That is, what could be the crucial point? Well, I think the crucial point in the electoral college is, is, is the electoral college, that it is not, this is in the presidential election, that it is, that we are not going to be electing a president with a popular vote, that even if President Biden wins the popular vote by two or three million votes, he is likely to lose the Electoral College. So that those states that I've mentioned now twice are the ones that you absolutely have to concentrate on. And you will see, if you watch this campaign, that's where the candidates will go. That's the, those are the, dis, the states that they're going to be spending most of their time working on. I hope that answers your question. I think somebody can come back into the chat if it doesn't, it doesn't answer your question. Second question. Do caucuses play an important role during the election process? Are they, be, are they different in, in every state? That's a great question. Caucuses used to play a very important role in the democratic process, particularly in, in the nominating process. Um, prior to 1968, um, 1968 was a, a crucial election in terms of changing the um, uh, uh, way in which we nominate our candidates. Prior to 1968, only 15 or 16 states had primaries. Almost everybody was chosen in a caucus. And that was felt to be, a caucus, just for those who do not know, are, mem are meet literal physical meetings of party members who get together and decide who the delegates to the convention will be and who they will support at the convention or whether they will go uncommitted. So something in the neighbor of 35 states had caucuses prior to 68. They were thought to be undemocratic in 1968 then Vice President Hubert Humphrey won the Democratic nomination without running in any primaries. Um, and people thought that wasn't a Democratic. We changed the process. We have primaries all over the place now. There are very few states that still hold caucuses. They're under very strict rules. In 2020, Iowa held caucuses, and they've always been very famous for their early caucuses. And the administration of those caucuses was a disaster. And the Democrats essentially took the power away from them. So caucuses play a very, very minor role. And the only role they play is in very small states. North Dakota, I believe, just had its caucuses, maybe yesterday, the day before for the Republicans. But North Dakota has very few delegates to the convention. Um, so I don't think they play a role that they should have played. I actually loved caucuses because I thought they built um, strong participant activists out of the caucuses. But when I loved caucuses, I, it was a minority view, and I think it's even more minority view now. Um, I see what's happening here. Okay. As a teacher, what do young people in America, in America, your students, uh, think about the electoral college system versus a popular vote? <laughs> well, I, of course, always ask that question, to, particularly to freshmen. And, um, and I think it's important to, to understand this, that um, most Americans don't understand the electoral college system. If you asked people um, who you vote for in a presidential election, most Americans would say, I'm voting for Joe Biden or Donald Trump. In fact, what you are voting for is electors who are pledged to vote for Joe Biden 
or Donald Trump. And my students would have said, would say, that's crazy. We should just vote directly for the person. I say, that's crazy. We should vote directly for the person. But it is very, very difficult to change that system. Um, I have, there are a number of alternatives that you could have. I favor almost all of them. The easiest alternative would be, so small states say they don't want to give up that little two vote advantage. I think that's foolish of them politically because you know, who cares about the four votes from Rhode Island compared to the 22 votes from uh, uh, Ohio, a state that has, has more electoral votes. Um, but if you still want to do that, you could have a proportional election. You could say, if you have 20 votes and you get, uh, you have 20 delegates going to the convention and you get 60% of the vote in that, in that primary, you'll get 60% of 20, which is 12 delegates. And if somebody else gets um, uh, 30%, they will get 30% of 20. And if somebody else gets 10%, they'll get 10% of 20. You could do that easily. And that would get rid of the winner-take-all aspect of it. Or you could go to the system that Maine has, uh, which is do it by district. That isn't quite as good as proportional representation, but it's better than the system that we have now. The strange thing, which very few people know about, is there are people who are actually the electors. And it has happened not infrequently, like about nine or ten times in our history, where an elector pledged to one candidate has voted for somebody else. The least thing you could, could do is get rid of those people and have the electoral votes cast automatically. But all of those require some sort of change in the Constitution. That's very, very difficult to do. The last time we had a very tightly contested presidential election before 2000, I guess in 2000 as well, but the, the one before that, um, we had a great push to try to change the Electoral College, to try to get it through Congress. It was led by then Senator Birch Bayh from Indiana and they just couldn't get it done. And I thought, and I do think still, if, if we don't change it after 2000 or after 2016, I don't think we're ever likely to change it. So my students would not like it. I don't like it. I don't think it's likely to change. My question is, which of the candidates is expected to have the most well-organized election campaign? Oh, another very good question. So it's a good question for the following reason. In 2020, there is no question that Joe Biden had the most organized campaign. Um, it was a well-oiled machine. And the Trump campaign reflected Trump's personality, which is shoot from the hip, do whatever you can do, screaming, yelling, um, no real structured organization. This time around, the Biden campaign, at least in my judgment, other people can can differ about this, and I'm sure other people do differ about this. The Biden campaign is very poorly organized or slow to get organized, I think is a better way uh, to, to, to put it. I have a friend who was asked to take a very high level position in the Biden campaign and decided not to because this friend felt that the campaign wasn't organized well enough and that they might be blamed for a bad result. On the other hand, um, the Trump campaign, which is I think shown an incredible amount of discipline so far. It seems to be very well uh, organized. It has traditional Republican organizers leading the campaign. They have been doing their best, not an easy task, to keep President, former President Trump on message. They've done that some of the time. They've done that much more than they ever thought they were going to be able to do. They are um, not having these huge rallies um, that they had in the past because those huge rallies were very expensive. And as a result of those huge rallies, they didn't have enough money um, at the end of the campaign to do what, to what they wanted to do to get out the vote. They're working out hard on a get out the vote effort to get their people to the campaign. Um, they are um, um, uh, was cutting down on the number of staff they had in order to, um, again, to save money for the campaign. So I would say today, you know, March, March 5th, which is still uh, eight months before the election, um, the, the Trump campaign is more organized and is showing better discipline and organization than is the Biden campaign. What will happen at the end, that's up for anybody to see. I think that's all the questions that I see. I just want to thank you again. Um,
you know, the, the, the um, takeaway that I want to leave you with is that the American system has gone on for a long time. It has a lot of very interesting features. It is not the perfect system. The perfect system has not been invented. But if you want to understand what's going on in the American election, it's important to understand how the system works, not how the system might work if it were better. Um, so those people who were saying, gee, um, I don't like either um, President Trump, former President Trump or President Biden, um, what else can I do? The answer is nothing at this point of time. And one of those two men, given their health stays the same and no nothing very unusual happens, is going to be the next president of the United States. And people should figure out um, that they have to vote for, for, for one of those two people. Uh, this campaign is going to come down to, I think, three different categories of people who are going to vote. One is the people who are those 70% who are saying, I'm not going to vote for either of those people. What they do is going to determine who comes in the election. Second is the independent voters, non-Democrats or non-Republicans. President uh, Biden won those voters, independent voters, by I think it was 15% in 2020, and he's leading only by 7% in the polls this time around. That's a, a, a very bad thing. And the third group, which frankly none of the media are talking about very much, and I think they should be talking about more, is what happens to the Haley voters? What happens to the never Trump Republicans? Um, if they sit it out, that's one thing. If they vote for President Biden, that's something else. Uh, Senator uh, uh, Murkowski just said the other day that she would never vote for Trump, but she won't vote for Biden either. In my view, that's a half a vote for Trump. Um, and if you're never Trump, you're a half a vote for Trump. The same thing, I believe Senator Mitt Romney has said the same thing. Um, I get it. Uh, if you're somebody who is a Republican and has been your entire life, but you in fact view President Trump as a, as a threat to democracy as we know it, then you have to swallow some things and vote him. I, but I think what we're going to see in this election is what happens to those voters. And I think pollsters will start separating out those three groups of respondents, the don't like either of them, the independents, which I do now, and the Republicans who don't like Trump. And we will know how this election is going to turn out um, by seeing how they, how they vote. Thank you all very much for listening. And again, thank you to the American Senator in Moscow for sponsoring this talk. It's been my pleasure to talk to you. And I'm certainly willing, if any of you want to send me questions, uh, my email is lsmazel, L-S, my last name, at colby.edu. I'd be glad to answer anything you have. Thank you all very much.